Uh, okay, good afternoon everybody, uh, and welcome to the uh, first of two sessions covering the small matter of MIFID II. Uh, in this session, we look at the key issues affecting assets and managers. Uh, my name is Bobby, Bobby Jahal, and I shall be your chair for the next, uh, oh, about 58 minutes or so. So the agenda for the session is as on the screen in front of you. Uh, we'll say a quick hello to the panel, firstly, uh, and then we'll dive into the murky waters of, uh, of the recast MIFID. So, uh, to the panel, I'm joined by a number of esteemed members of the, of the advisory and service provider community to the world of asset management. If I could ask you to firstly introduce yourself, maybe Michael, to begin with. Um, it doesn't help a lot when I stand up. You still can't see me, but I'm, <laughs> I'm Michael Houghton. Um, I run a little corporate access business called Engage, um, and I spent 10 years as a fund manager before that and eight years on the sell side before that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a Leonard Hung. I'm a co-head of the EU Financial Services Regulatory Practice at Sydney Austin. Uh, we represent a lot of investment managers, hedge fund, PE funds, and so on. Adam Jacobs. I head up markets regulation at the Alternative Investment Management Association. Uh, we're a global trade association representing the hedge fund industry and being responsible for markets regulation. MIFID II is a, a substantial chunk of what I'm focusing on. Arjun Singh Michelle, I'm Senior Advisor, Regulatory Affairs at the Investment Association. Um, I lead on our um, advocacy and policy work in relation to uh, MIFID. Thank you very much all. So <clears throat> uh, before we turn once again to the panel, uh, I shall present a very brief history of the, the legislation. Uh, so to begin at the, uh, the very beginning, um, physics. Uh, physics begat chemistry, chemistry begat biology. And then with a few twists and turns in between, um, physics begat the Markets of Financial Instruments Directive. Um, it's the framework of EU legislation, of course, for, the, for, in, for investment intermediaries, uh, providing a defined set of services to clients in respect of a defined set of financial instruments and the organised trading of those instruments. <clears throat> the, the, the recast MIFID is also one of the most ambitious pieces of, of EU legislation, therefore most necessarily one of the most contentious so following the conclusion of the, the trial process in January 2014, Michelle Bernier, who was then the European Commissioner for, uh, for the uh, Internal Markets and Services, said, uh, these new rules will improve the way capital markets function to the benefit of the real economy. They are a key step towards establishing a safer, more open and more responsible financial system and restoring, uh, restoring investor confidence in the wake of the financial crisis. And fairly lofty ambitions indeed. So without wishing to dwell for too long on the machinery of EU rulemaking, very quickly, MIFID II is indeed the, the product of the Lam for Lucy process, of course, so it comes in two parts. We have the revised directive and the markets and financial instruments regulation. Uh, they both compose level one measures. Uh, they in turn are supplemented by level two measures, uh, which take two forms, delegated acts, which are drafted by the European Commission on the basis of advice provided by the European Securities and Markets Authority. Um, we have technical standards that are drafted by ESMA and approved by the European Commission. And then we have the additional uh, level three standards, uh, level three measures, I should say, uh, in the form of ESMA guidelines and commission FAQs, which I'm, I might venture those probably be very important indeed, given that most of the level two measures are uh, issued largely as regulations and therefore are directly applicable, leaving very limited room for local interpretation So the original MIFID um, was a very different animal, I think it's fair to say, born of a, a more innocent age uh, with more modest ambitions, concerned as it was uh, with the creation of, a, I guess, a simpler a single market with simpler cross-border trading and rules primarily focused on, on, on equities markets. Um, it was always intended, of course, that MIFID would be reviewed, but that review coincided with the small matter of the 2008 financial crisis and then the scope and ambition of the review of MIFID changed completely. So the draft version of MIFID II, proposed in October 2011, after much politicking, we had the final version approved in the beginning of 2014, uh, with a start date of 3rd of Jan 2017, and we'll, we'll come to that start date a little bit later. So in between, I think it's fair to say we've had numerous publications, uh, a little bit of an understatement perhaps, um, with the important final draft and, the, and I guess the bulk of the, of the technical standards arriving from ESMA in September 2015, uh, a number of delegated acts remain outstanding from the EC, of course, and uh, I guess most of those are expected in, in the next quarter, well, this quarter, rather, so the next few weeks, I suppose, next month. Um, member state implementation, uh, due to be completed by July 2016, as, as per the original uh, timeline, 
uh, has seen the publication of two discussion papers in the UK, uh, one each from the Treasury and the FCA, and, the, and also one consultation paper which was very recently described by the FCA in a recent round table as being little more than legal carpentry, which is a, I'll leave you to um, take from that what you will. Uh, so the slide here behind me uh, summarises the, the composition, um, well, I suppose actually I suppose more accurately, the, the location of some of the more newsworthy topics uh, for asset managers, and then I also suppose also acts as a, a degree of a, a spoiler, uh, for a bit of a spoiler for what, what's to come in terms of the topics we're going to discuss in this session and probably a little bit on the next session also. Uh, the directive covers many of the topics in the original, of course, the revised directive, such as scope of course organisation and conduct of business rules, and the and the fear, uh, the, market, the, the, the regulation uh, covers more sort of, I suppose, microstructural issues and, and market reforms. <clears throat> so, how precisely does MIFID II seek to achieve its objectives? Uh, displayed here, I suppose, in a kind of cycle of virtue, if I can, if I can call it that. Um, how do we, how do we, how, how does it, it rather intend to establish a safer, sounder, more transparent and responsible financial system? Uh, to deliver on its G20 commitments to tackle less regulated and more opaque parts of the financial system, uh, to ensure a more integrated and efficient EU financial market, um, to reduce costs to participants and improve conditions of access. So um, to find out, let's, let's turn to the panel. Um, where to begin? Um, I suppose we can begin the topic with the topic of transaction reporting. Um, historically, many asset managers have not really had to contend so much with this issue, uh, being able to place reliance as they could on, on, their, um, on their counterparties. Um, however, um, Adam, if I could turn to you first, um, um, are we to understand that MIFID II probably challenges that position? Indeed we are. So one of the key features of MIFIR is that it will require investment firms to report transactions in financial instruments to their regulator. And when I say financial instruments there, we're talking about the MIFID II uh, universe of anything that can be tr uh, traded on a MIFID II category of tr uh, trading venue. So whether that's an OTF, uh, MTF, or regulated markets, so it's a very expansive uh, set of instruments. Uh, importantly, you don't actually have an obligation to report a transaction if all you are doing is transmitting that order to another firm to execute for you. So if you are an asset manager and you're transmitting an order to your broker to execute for you, then you don't actually have uh, an obligation to report that transaction. It falls squarely on the party to whom you transmitted the order. There are, though, a couple of quite significant qualifiers associated with this concept of transmission, which on the face of it um, appears pretty welcome. The first is that you have to have a written agreement with the person to whom you're sending the order uh, in which you both agree that the understanding is that they will report for you, uh, that that is order transmission. And you also, as the asset manager, have to send them all of the fields that they would need to be able to populate the transaction report. Uh, to, to fulfil the transaction report in respect to that order, which is uh, a, a significant number of fields over and uh, above what would be reported today. So we're talking over 60 fields. Um, our understanding at present from talking to members is that by, for the most members, I think self-reporting will be the route that people actually ultimately go down. And that reflects the fact that if you look <laughs> at some of those qualifiers that sit alongside the concept of transmission, while transmission on the face of it looks appealing, when you consider what you would have to do in practice, it suddenly seems like less of a, a desirable option. So if you have to come up with written agreements with all of your brokers with whom you potentially execute or trans to whom you transmit orders, if you look at the precedent under Amir, um, that was particularly difficult when it came to agreeing on delegated reporting terms and you can well imagine that you might have some similar commercial frustrations if you had to go down the route of uh, coming up with transmission agreements under MIFIR. Similarly, if you're sending them all of this uh, vast array of data, do you actually want to send all of that data to your broker if some of it could be sensitive? 
thinking around some of the identifier informations, if you've got information on particular uh, algos uh, in, in that um, report, which leads many managers to conclude, well, if I'd have to have all of these agreements with all these various counterparties, have to send them all of this information, why not actually just set up to report myself? And I, that is the approach that I know certainly larger managers are taking. I suspect as we get closer to the implementation date, whenever that might ultimately be, you probably will see a tale of smaller participants saying, well, actually, I'm not sure if I am in a position to report myself. Um, and, and maybe we'll see a last minute rush of people going to their brokers and saying, can you report for me? Um, but we haven't seen that so far. Um, it's probably also worth me just touching on the fact of MIFID implementation in the UK. Over the last year or so, we had been working on the basis that the FCA would take this requirement, which is framed very squarely as a requirement for investment firms, uh, and that it would read that requirement across to other types of asset managers, regardless of whether they're investment firms or uh, A firms, USITs managers, uh, given that for a similar activity you could expect a similar obligation, but that would be the logic on the part of the FCA. Uh, interestingly, having given various indications that that would be their approach, uh, in the December uh, consultation paper that they published on MIFID II implementation, uh, they've said quite explicitly, we have no intention at this stage of extending the obligation beyond MIFID investment firms. So if you're in the AFIM category, um, then you are safe for, for now unless you're doing uh, MIFID business. Um, so a, an interesting development. I think many will be breathing a sigh of relief having heard that in as much as when I speak to members, dealing commissions clearly top of the list in terms of what people are focusing on. Uh, but transaction reporting was a, a very close second in terms of operational concern. Um, thank you. We've actually had a question come through. Um, if I can read this out. Um, will the amount of data that must be provided to counterparties mean that many firms will, will not be able to use the transmitting firm exemption? So you mentioned before mm. there's lots and lots of data requirements compelled by, by Mifir, I guess. So, so will that be a practical possibility, do you think? Um, I think the... It's not in the, the mechanics of actually sending them that data, but I suppose it, the question becomes one of if I'm sending it all to them anyway and if I've had to find that data to identify where to collect the data from, I've had to build uh, systems to hold static data, what value does it add from my point of view to send that data to the counterparty to the trade? Because many of these fields will be fields over and above what would be included in the order to trade. Um, so there's various fields in there that would not form part of your instructions to the, to the broker. And if you've got to gather that data, send it all to them, there's no uh, logistical difficulty associated with that, but there becomes a, um, an implementation question of, of what is the value of going down that route if you could just send that data um, to your regulator yourself. One of the snags associated with transmission is that you still do retain a certain degree of responsibility to make sure that what is being reported uh, is reasonable and uh, I forget the exact terminology, but you, you still have a residual complete and, complete and accurate. Thank you. So if, if that is um, what your, your ultimate obligation, why not do it yourself and be more comfortable that that is the case? Thank you very much indeed. We've had another question come through. Actually, this may... It's probably relevant to a range of issues we're going to discuss, but it's, <clears throat> it's been pushed to the top of the agenda, so let's ask it now. Uh, will, inf will, will an enforcement action be required to change behaviour, or have we seen a new momentum? I think you've mentioned already that many firms uh, may decide to just take the, the obligation and, and, and make the, the requisite system changes, but do you think um, it may require more? There's only been a couple of transaction reporting mm -hmm. actions, from, from what I can recall, and not really necessarily against investment managers. It's more on the sell side, but do you think an investment, uh, sorry, an enforcement action might be a, a driver for change or? Potentially. I mean, everybody's looking to a mere reporting at present to see when the first uh, enforcement action might come off the back of that. The, the FCA did exercise as much forbearance as it could without sort of stretching the limits of the law, um, being very much aware that in the context of a mere, there were a lot of difficulties associated with the reporting go live. 
Um, I would anticipate a similar set of difficulties when it comes to MIFID transaction reporting, particularly for firms who've not had to do it previously. I, I know some firms will already report today and they'll be building on existing systems, but for those whom it, for whom it's a new topic, that it will be a struggle. Um, I, I, perhaps it will be a similar approach that the FCA will initially perhaps show some forbearance, but ultimately enforcement is perhaps the most powerful tool they have to, to get people to focus on, on uh, reporting. And uh, from when you hear a discussion of people who work on transaction reporting, uh, I, I think if the regulator's not in the room, they, they would say quite frankly that there are still a lot of problems associated with MIFID mm. reporting today. And, and that's it. one final question before we, we change topics, if I may. Uh, do you believe that ESMA is actually doing anything useful with the data? Uh, taxation question mark, systemic risk question mark? They um, repeatedly say that they do use reporting data. Um, the, there is a question of whether they are getting the right data uh, relative to what they actually want to do with it, and I'm, I'm not sure that is always the case. But in the context of Amir, the FCA has said we, we, we do use that data. Certainly transaction reporting is a cornerstone of uh, FCA's market abuse work. So Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, we have to bear in mind that transaction reporting is not the same as Amir reporting. Amir reporting is about... Uh, finding out where the risks in the system are, so who's got exposures to which counterparties, but transaction reporting in MIFID or indeed in remit is about market soundness or market cleanliness, if you like. So it's a market abuse driven Absolutely. analysis. It's not, it's not even ESMA looking at it, it's the FCA that Absolutely. wants it. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have one very quick Pony question. I think I'm right in saying that's on this. So just in, understand, in terms of understanding behaviours, currently we've already mentioned, I think it's fair to say most managers do rely on their, tr on their counterparties to report. Um, but if I could ask you to, to get your thumbs at the ready, do you, um, in terms of polling question, do you currently rely on your, rely on your counterparties for transaction reporting? Answer yes for all transactions, B yes partially for some transactions, and C no we do it in house. like daytime television. Okay. Yeah, so we've actually got a fair number of people who do do it themselves, but as expected, most, most do indeed um, rely on their counterparties. Okay, thank you very much for participating in that. So let's move on uh, to the question of transparency. Um, it's often seen as the, the panacea for, for all ills. Um, Arjun, uh, can I ask you to... Uh, tell us how the rules in the MIFID II uh, propose to shine an ever brighter light on this, on, on the markets. Sure. Um, so what I'll do is I'll break it up into asset class, and because um, uh, the transparency requirements are calibrated depending on uh, uh, which are asset class dependent. So if we start with equities, um, on the buy side, our concerns with e with equities are relatively uh, few, with the exception of the double volume cap mechanism and looking at how the uh, how looking at how that mechanism will will function going forward. Um, it's, it's important to bear in mind that the obligation to report and the obligation for the operation of the cap is not on the counterparties, but rather on the trading venues and the platforms themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's the trading venues or platforms who will apply the cap and will regulate the cap. Um, one of the issues we have with the volume cap mechanism is that it's a very large hammer for a rather small nail. Um, so if you look at some of the names that are traded in the dark currently, look at some of the shares that are traded in the dark currently, um, you know, these are uh, big names that are traded in the dark. So looking at Royal Mail, for instance, I think at my last count about 24% of Royal Mail is traded in the dark. Looking at the Pearson Group, um, which we used to own the Financial Times, about 18 to 19% of the Pearson Group is traded in the dark. What the regulators wanted to do with pushing the volume cap in place was to try and minimize the use of dark pools and shift this activity onto regulated markets or onto uh, stock exchanges, as it were. Um, in our view, we do not necessarily think that that is likely to happen. Um, going from a dark, a dark venue to an entirely lit venue is improbable. Um, in our view, what's likely to happen is these order sizes are simply going to become larger um, so they can benefit from the large and scale waiver. Um, that, of course, raises a concern is um, if transactions do become larger, um, then 
then on the post with the post trade report where there has to be a post trade where there's a deferral for large and scale waiver for for up to 24 hours. Um, once that information becomes public, and given that these will be large transactions, um, it is likely to shift the price of that particular share, um, as opposed to currently, where it would simply be traded in the dark um, using child orders uh, connected back to a larger parent order. Um, so that's one of the issues that we're currently well, one of the issues that we're currently grappling with when it comes to equities. For ETFs, we're relatively comfortable where the rules around ETFs transparency are. We think they could have actually been more ambitious. Um, ETFs are products that were created to be super liquid instruments, and so they can support more transparency. So we wanted ESMA to go further um, on ETFs. For our biggest issue rests with cash bonds. And how are, how's the bond market going to react to having pre-trade transparency if, on a high level Europe's going to be the only jurisdiction in the world that will have pre-trade transparency for cash bonds. There's no other jurisdiction that does. A lot of people argue that trace is pre-trade, but trace in the US is not pre-trade, it's post-trade transparency. And one of the issues we've had with pre-trade transparency as a principle, but particularly for bonds, is that it's no reflection of true market reality. Nothing's actually been executed. Um, so it, can, uh, it, provi it provides a false impression of what that particular market looks like. What ESMA's done when it comes to calibrating pre-trade transparency for cash bonds is they've adopted an approach called the instrument-by-instrument instrument approach, where a particular instrument will be made subject to transparency depending upon its historical trading activity. So looking at historical trading activity of a bond will determine its future, applica its future application of transparency upon that particular instrument. We've always argued that historical trading activity has no bearing to how a bond will trade in the future. Bonds are news-driven instruments. So if you look at, for example, some more recent, uh, some more recent um, circumstances, look at Glencore, for instance, um, or Volkswagen, um, or uh, well, one of the bonds that has been the most actively traded in the last 72 weeks in Europe has been Petrobras um, around the uh, alleged corruption allegations in Brazil. Um, it's news stories that drive trading activity in bonds. And news stories, of course, you can't predict the future as far as how, as far as what sort of news stories will break when it comes to an actual corporate, for instance. So to try and use historical trading activity to predict the future, we've always argued is not possible. But that's what they've adopted. For newly issued instruments, it's a little more problematic because if it's a newly issued instrument, there is no historical trading data. So they've argued that issuance size ought to be used to determine whether that particular instrument will be subject to transparency. So for a corporate bond, for instance, if a newly issued corporate bond is greater than 500 million euros, then for up to five and a half months, that bond will automatically be determined to be liquid and therefore subject to transparency. Um, and for sovereigns, it's, if a sovereign issuance is greater than 1 billion euros, um, then it automatically will be subject to transparency for up to the first five, uh, five and a half months um, post issuance. But if you look at how bonds trade, a corporate bond in particular will never trade for more than two trades per day after day five post issuance. And if one of the criteria ESMA picked to determine liquidity for a bond, that a bond must trade for two trades per day in order to be determined to be liquid, after day five, these bonds will never meet that criteria, but will be subject to transparency. So um, Trax have very kindly provided us with their, uh, provided us with access to their data, and looking and Trax covers roughly about 65 to 70 percent of the European bond market, and about 25 percent of all newly issued instruments will be misclassified as liquid, and therefore will be mis uh, will have transparency misapplied onto these instruments. And what, and very quickly to wrap up, um, that, that raises a concern for us as far as our ability to actually execute in those names. If it's a truly illiquid instrument that has transparency subjected to it inaccurately, then, it is, then any transaction in that, uh, in that misclassified instrument or in that false positive um, is likely to shift the price in that illiquid instrument more dramatically than if it was correctly calibrated. And in addition to that, so it makes it more expensive for us to buy or execute in that particular bond. And there is a real world impact of this. The actual corporate that's issued that debt, the price of that debt is likely to fluctuate um, excessively if it is misclassified as, uh, as liquid and therefore mis as, uh, subject to transparency. 
and this does have a real world impact on corporates that do issue debt. There, is, there are waivers available, uh, pre-trade waivers available, so exemptions available from transparency. There are two of them for bonds. One is the size specific to the instrument or the SSTI, which is available to brokers. The other is a large in scale, which is available to all counterparties. And there's a big political debate about how to calibrate the SSTI and LIS. Won't go into technical details about that. Um, but just to say that for corporates, at our estimation, in order, to in order for an asset manager to benefit from the large and scale waiver, uh, you're looking at a transaction size of roughly about um, 500,000 euros or greater in order to benefit from the large and scale waiver. And for a broker to benefit from the SSTI, <coughs> excuse me, broker to benefit from the SSTI, um, for a corporate, you're looking at an execution of roughly about 300,000 euros. Um, but that waiver only applies, uh, uh, only applies for a limited window on a post-trade basis where it'll, uh, you'll only be protected from post-trade transparency if that transaction benefits from the waiver for up to a period of 24, uh, 24 hours, uh, uh, depending on the actual instrument traded. So I'll stop there. <laughs> If there are any questions, happy to take them. Thank you very much. And yeah, I think we'll be covering or going into that um, that issue uh, in greater detail in the next session also. So thank you so much for that. Let's um, <clears throat> let's skip ahead to the next topic at hand. Um, and it's one of the topics that's probably fair to say one of the most controversial issues with the package, uh, that of dealing commissions and the use of research. And I think it's that topic has caused a number of delays um, in the trialogue process and the, at, at, at the European level. Um, <clears throat> Michael, can I, can I ask you to... Uh, uh, give us an overview of the, of the MIFID II proposals and perhaps and after that a, a flavour of how the issues progressed over the last few years. Um, yes, well, um, how long have we got? Um, <laughs> and, and obviously with Dealing Commission, I think the first thing to say uh, is, of course, that we don't know. You know we, we, we don't yet know what the final proposals are, but we do have a few very important clues. Um, and I thought where I would, I would try and focus a bit of attention is, is not on the big question as to whether or not... Um, client money can be used to pay for research, which is where the focus lies, but actually some of the really important issues that are behind the Dealing Commission point, which, which seem to be ignored in, in, in the mix. Um, and I think the three things I wanted to say, but the first one um, is that this is happening anyway, um, and, and, and that we're now seeing really clear evidence from big asset managers who are taking a lead and saying, look, we're not going to wait for delegated acts any longer. Um, it's you know, June, September, December, January, March. It doesn't matter. We know the direction of travel, and we're going to shift. Um, and so we've seen names such as Bailey Gifford, who have been you know, public and outspoken about this and moved as of January to execution-only rates, um, paying for corporate access and, and research out of P&L. Um, several other very big asset managers um, who I could, I could point to who, who are, again, saying, we know the direction of travel. We know that this is coming. Um, we are very concerned about um, using any sort of client money to pay for research and then find that ultimately um, you can't and it then becomes almost impossible to change that number because that would be a de facto admission of not, not spending client money as if it were your own. So I think, I think we're going to see full unbundling from asset managers um, and we're going to see uh, uh, you know, that means that execution rates um, and the amounts that are paid for research are going to plummet. Um, and that, 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 I think, would be the, you know, the, the, the critical point. As an extension of that, um, I think one of the most important aspects of MIFID in terms of dealing commission is not what you're allowed to do, but it's the cost disclosure. You know, if you are an active fund manager and you're currently charging 100 bips or 150 bips, I think, from the FCA's paper as, as the average, um, and your consumer is comparing that to, to Vanguard at 12, you know, that's already a sales and marketing challenge. You know, once you've actually got to disclose that you're know, bunging in all the other costs as well, it's more like 250 bips. That becomes a, a near impossibility. And so I, I would suggest that from a purely sales and marketing perspective, it's the, the cost disclosure which is going to be driving behavioral change. Um, and again, pointing to Bailey Gifford, you know, we are now seeing some of these big asset managers, and there are others, who are using this as a sales and marketing opportunity. Um, it's about being able to show to the underlying client um, that we are, we are spending your money properly. Um, and, and of course, by, by reducing the amount that's spent on dealing commission, that is a significant boost to performance for many funds. You know, wasting half a, you know, half a percentage point um, on dealing commissions in a 7% interest rate environment, arguably, you know, that wasn't too bad. But in a low return world, spending 50 or 100 bips is, is a major problem. Um, and so I think it's that commercial reality um, which will cause a big, a big shift. And that, that seems to have escaped people's attention. 
So this um, feels like a, a course the FCA has been been taking prior to any, well, probably concurrent with MIFID II discussions in the background, but the FCA have been on this path, it feels like, for a while, and they've issued a number of updates yes, to their rules. Yes, absolutely, they have. And again, this, is, this would then be, the, I think, the second critical point about MIFID and dealing commission. So if you look at the unbundling actions the FCA have taken, particularly PS 14.7 and separating out um, or, uh, payments for corporate access, uh, I think pretty much everybody would say that, well, this hasn't led to any change of behavior in the UK market. You know, we can clearly see that that's the case. Corporate access is still 90% intermediated by the investment bank. And we all know why this hasn't led to a change of behavior. It's because the, the, the original idea was flawed. It only applies to the buy side, not the sell side. So what's happened? Um, everybody on the buy side says, oh, we don't pay for corporate access. They've all taken it out of their, their, their broker vote. Every single sell side house has said, oh, we don't charge for corporate access. It's free. Um, and yet we all know that corporate broking in the UK market is free, hence the wholesale competition review um, and, and other regulatory instruments. So neither the corporate's paying um, nor the institution's paying, and yet this is an extremely expensive service. So who is paying? You know, I, it must be the tooth fairy. Um, so, and, and I think this is, this is one of the, you know, the key realizations and the critical changes that MIFID will bring about um, is that if there is some rollback on the proposals for research, I don't know, but I suspect that there will be, and there will be mechanisms by which client money can be used for research. Assuming that happens, it is absolutely critical that um, MIFID maintains corporate access as an inducement. Otherwise, it will become permissible to use client money to pay for corporate access. Now, I see no way, no way in the world that the FCA would allow what would then be a rollback in the existing rules. Um, and if you look at where the, the lobbying has centered and all of the controversy, it's all about research. It's not about corporate access. There is widespread general agreement um, that fund managers should not be allowed to pay for meetings with companies out of client money. Now, this is a critical point because corporate access is the reality of what most fund managers pay brokers for. You know, they're not really interested in research. They're certainly not interested in paying eight bips in execution when they can pay one bip in DMA. So if MIFID maintains corporate access as an inducement as per the technical draft, then what that does is it prohibits the free supply as well as the, 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 um, you know, the, the, um, the, the demand side of the equation. So that will change behavior. Corporate access will suddenly have to be priced on a standalone basis. There are many big fund managers, one, one large global house who we work for that does 6,000 meetings in London a year. Now, if you look at some of the estimates that are out there of what the real cost of corporate access is, Macquarie estimate that their team costs them $1,500 a meeting, then you can soon start to see what the cost of this activity is. It's millions of dollars a year for a fund manager. And so separating that out from a regulatory point of view is the critical ingredient in getting commission rates down. And we know that best execution rates from DMA are one to three bips. They certainly aren't four to six bips or even six to eight bips, as some people are saying. So I, th I think that, that is the real story okay. about dealing commissions. It's that it's happening anyway. Um, the, the, the more, the, um, you know, there's a lot of big fund managers who are getting on the front foot and getting ahead of the curve. That presents a marketing opportunity um, and, and this, this enables fund managers to get the costs down for their, for their clients. And, and that would be my final point. It's an opportunity, it's not a threat. Please, say, please. It's, it. it's, it's perhaps easy for Bailey Gifford or someone like that, you know, <clears throat> one of the very large asset managers to say, I'll pay, out, pay for research out of P&L um, and perhaps not even raise the, asset, the annual management fee. But a lot of the large asset managers are developing internal research functions which means, in fact, they're not going to be paying external research houses for the research anyway. I think a lot of people in this room will be perhaps not from those very large houses, but from much smaller ones. Um, and I think it's going to be a real question as to how you manage it, because the small asset manager isn't going to have the internal research function. They're going to have to decide whether or not they, they want to pay for it out of you know, their, their own P&L and then try and have that conversation with their client about, oh, can I increase my annual management fee to you, in which case the response is usually no. Um, or you agree a separate research amount with your client that they'll, that they'll pay. The, the text that we've seen from December, which is sort of leaked text, is not entirely clear as to whether or not that account is pre-funded or whether or not you can sort of use it as a ledger and then tell the client to pay the money in. But be that as it may, it's very clearly unbundled. And all the press you've been reading about, oh, the December text is wonderful for asset managers, Correct me if I'm wrong, from the AMA point of view, I don't see it being very different at all. There's some 
slight wording about maybe recognizing the role that CSAs may play, but you still have full unbundling, you still have to fully account for the amount. So the client will always know exactly what they're paying for the research. I think, so I think we're just heading, you're right, we're heading exactly in that direction, whichever way you look at it. So maybe just to follow up on Leonard's point, you know, some of the, some of the, the, the big global asset managers who we are talking to, particularly in the US, um, are, are starting to say, well, hold on, we're, we're gonna roll this out in the, in the States too, because it's completely indefensible for us to have clients based in the UK market um, where we're saying, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna take the cost of research onto our P&L, but you guys in the US, you can pay. You know, it, it, from a purely marketing perspective, it, it just doesn't add up. I mean, it, you know, charging the client for research on top of a management fee, I, I always liken it to going to a restaurant um, and paying your bill and then getting a charge for the, you know, for the laundry and the cutlery on top. It just, it doesn't make any sense. It's a cost of doing business. And so I, I think we will, we will see the asset management community move down that route and they will be looking for efficient solutions. How can we do this within the context of our P&L in a much more efficient way than it has been done at the moment? Except that what they're selling is they're gonna say, well, instead of the six bips that I put at your commission, it's now only three or two because I'm no longer, you know, paying the four, in my example, for, for research. Yeah. Um, if, if I could, um, given that I represent asset managers, if I could defend the industry here just ever so slightly, um, the current UK model works well. Um, when, there's, um, when the FCA brought in a ban on corporate access, um, you know, there, was a, there was an uproar. Um, and one of the reasons why we were concerned by that ban was that in our competitor jurisdictions, particularly France, for, uh, particularly Paris, for instance, <coughs> corporate access is permitted. Um, so, uh, you know, so this idea uh, we think is rather misplaced that, um, that MIFID bans corporate access. MIFID does not particularly ban corporate access. Um, uh, one of the reasons why <coughs> uh, we have that interpretation, as it were, because it's a minimum harmonizing directive. So the legal structure of MIFID as a minimum harmonizing directive means that different jurisdictions can apply, um, uh, can uh, have the minimal rules they want, or they can gold plate. We know the FCA <coughs> will, will gold plate the uh, inducements requirements here in the UK, but we also know that, uh, that the AMF in Paris certainly will not. You know, so it does create a competitive disadvantage of the place or the status of the City of London as a global research house or a global research center vis-a-vis -vis Paris, for instance. Um, the concern that, uh, you know, we certainly have the view that uh, CSAs or enhanced CSAs are permitted within, are permitted within the uh, uh, directive, a single payment for research, a single payment for commissions or a single payment for research is permitted. Um, you know, we think that clients having transparency over how, over what we're paying for and how we're paying for it is a good thing. We think that having ex-ante budgets in place that are agreed with our clients is a good thing. We think having rules and that minimize cross subsidization between funds is a good thing. Um, if, we can dem if we can demonstrate that we are managing those conflicts of interest and that we are, and that we are achieving best execution for our clients, um, uh, and, and uh, achieving the best outcome for our clients using the current model, we do not see where the concerns are. The issue, the biggest issue we have as a buy side currently with the text is the treatment of fixed income research. There is no commission market in fixed income research whatsoever. Um, fixed income research, in our view, is free of charge. Yeah, um, there is a spread payment in fixed income. If we now have to start paying using commissions for fixed income research, spreads are not going to narrow. Um, you know, some argue that, that research costs are priced within the spread, uh, uh, you know, so that if we start paying separately for fixed income research, spreads will narrow. They will not narrow. So we're going to have to start paying more for the same execution quality than we are currently. Um, you know, so for us, there needs to be some sort of um, uh, special treatment of fixed income research or some sort of exemption for fixed income research entirely from uh, the requirement to use or from uh, the requirement to pay for research separately. Um, when it comes to broke unbundling, we support broke unbundling. We think it's a good, we think that's a good thing. We want to know um, what we're paying for um, how, uh, in what proportion we're paying for it. So we understand that a lot of brokers are, are, are looking to offer a menu card or rate card, as it were, that will break down the actual costs involved when we're transmitting commissions. 
could, we could we could probably continue this all, all afternoon. But let me just let me just pose a couple of questions that we've received from the from the audience. Um, uh, let's see which one to select. Okay, um, let's just shunt it down. Here we are. Uh, will a U.S. manager of a U.K. fund, a U.S. manager of a U.K. fund, be caught by the Mifid Commission rules? Um, perhaps. Uh, well, I mean, now the answer to that question yeah, would be a, yes. But um, well, it's a it's a sort of a legally legalistic question. First of all, you won't find a U.S. manager of a U.K. fund directly. In any event, the U.S. manager is not subject to Mifid, so the answer would be no. But I think the question is probably a bit different from that. Yeah. I think it's probably the, the intent is probably slightly different, which is maybe a US manager with a UK affiliate, maybe a sub, sub advisor, for example. The sub advisor clearly is caught by these rules. The question is whether or not, if, you, if the US manager were to, were to receive research from Morgan Stanley in New York, for example, the, the, US the US manager will treat the UK manager as well. We're part of the same group, the same research and trading team. So I'm going to share the research with the UK entity then the UK entity would say, actually, I can't receive that, notwithstanding I'm not responsible for directing um, payments because it is still a payment received. So the, the rule says an investment manager cannot receive these things, not that, you know, not that someone can't pay it, or not, not that someone can't give it to you, it's just that you can't receive it. So in that situation, I think it becomes very tricky. You'd effectively have to say, actually, I can't receive it, or if I do receive it, then we as a firm will have to somehow show that I am paying for my bit that I received from you in the US. <laughs> Yeah, it gets it gets tricky, but it's not a, it's not unsolved. So it's not unreasonable if you consider that otherwise you would be creating quite a significant loophole if a, a global asset manager could just route all of their uh, research spend through U.S. execution or soft uh, soft dollars, mm. basically. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So we have a very common scenario of, of U.K. houses, uh, sorry, U.S. houses having U.K. managers, uh, where you have a commonality of portfolio manager across. Jurisdictions. So that's exactly as we were saying. The, 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 the issue becomes very tricky indeed. Um, I'm very conscious of time. I think we've got a couple of polling questions to pose just now um, on, on this particular issue, just to get a flavour of what's, what you, the audience, think and what your behaviours are. Uh, question, do you plan to pay for investment research from your own profit and loss and not from client funds, regardless of the final outcome of MIFID II? Answer A. Uh, yes and B, no. Let's see how that's... Please, please vote now. <laughs> oh. Well. Interesting. So does that tell us that there's a, there's a, a change? in behaviours in the market? What do we think about that? Um, Michael, perhaps, do you have a view? Um, well, I think um, compared to when we did a call on this issue, perhaps, um, <coughs> when was it, 18 months ago, when, from memory, a very similar question, um, we saw 51% of, of asset managers say that they would reduce what they spent if, if it had to come from p and I would say that, you know, that, that is a, it's material progress, and I think that will, that will move further. Excellent. Okay, so I think we have a second question. Um, sorry, skip see if we can get to that second question just now. Oops, sorry, did I miss the actual question? Um, uh, if research is to be paid from PL, uh, will your firm's research spend for? Uh, yes or no? Uh, vote now. So if your research is to be paid from PL, will your firm's research spend for? Again, so we see, I'm not sure if we track this particular issue, but there's a slight yes takes the, uh, takes the vote there. there's a, We will see a, s a slight fall in the uh, amount of uh, money spent on, on, um, on research. Okay, uh, we need to move on. Uh, we could have said we could have spent all afternoon on this topic, but let's move on to the next topic at the hand. Uh, and it's another area that we've discussed, it feels like, much over the years, perhaps not one that's quite as controversial, dealing commissions. Um, oh, that's, a, that's another question we'll come to in a little while, actually. Um, so the best execution. Um, Adam, if I can turn to you very quickly on, the, on this topic. Um, is there anything really yeah. new? Sorry. It might be Leonard for this one. Oh, I beg your pardon, Leonard. Uh, sorry. Yeah, might, I do, do I? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, whomever wants to take this topic, <laughs> yeah, okay. that'll be well, fine. <laughs> I mean, the best acts is um, 
uh, put it this way, the text in MIFID 2, um, including if you use the leaked version of the, of the level two text, is pretty much the same, in fact, copied word for word in many cases from MIFID 1, except that there are a couple of material differences. And the differences are not slight changes in wording, it's actually new paragraphs added. So it's actually very easy to actually compare and contrast what's in MIFID 1 and, and MIFID 2. And essentially, it boils down to two important things that you're going to have to do um, either as brokers or asset managers. I think most here are asset managers. Fundamentally, number one is your execution policy is going to have to be much more detailed than today. And the main reason for that is because, you know, today you're supposed to uh, give some description or, or deal with about five classes of instruments, right? Equities, debt, derivatives, and so on. In the new world, you're going to have classes and then subclasses. I think there are almost 20 or so uh, classes and subclasses all added together. So, for example, instead of OTC derivatives, you have you know, commodity derivatives, uh, securitized derivatives, you know, currency, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's much more detailed. So that's the first thing. That's easy enough to do, quite frankly, because it's a descriptive document. You have a policy, you know, Cordium, no doubt, will charge you some money for that, and you'll, you'll be done. But the next one is much more important, which is that it's a new requirement. Every year, annually, you're going to have to do two things. You're going to have to publicly disclose, number one, your execution quality that you're receiving from whoever you use, whether it's a venue if you're a broker or a broker if you are an asset manager. <clears throat> and secondly, you need to display your top five execution venues if you're a broker or brokers, top five brokers, if you're an asset manager. Let's just work on the assumption most people are asset managers, okay? It'll, just, it'll make it easier. So what does that mean? So execution quality, you, you now actually need to describe things like, well, how did, I, <clears throat> how did I deal with all the different criteria, price, ease of execution, and so on? You actually have to describe it. You have to describe things like conflicts of interest. How did I manage potential conflicts as between, or inducements as between different brokers? What, what did I receive? What minor or non-monetary benefits did I receive from brokers? All those things have to be disclosed. Okay, so that's description of execution quality. And to do that, you have to look at a massive amount of data. So the venues themselves are gonna publish, are required to publish about nine tables full of, of, of data for you to analyze. The brokers will analyze that, and then the brokers will ask you to do the same. You're going to somehow have to analyze all that data and produce a report. So that's going to be a significant undertaking to the point where the, the, the MEPs themselves who saw the table said, whoa, that's a lot of information, and they might actually kick back the RTS, which contains all these tables. That's the first thing. So the other aspect of the annual report is probably more important than anything, which is that if you're an asset manager, you need to describe the top five brokers you use Naming them in and of itself probably isn't too um, you know, bad, but you have to actually disclose effectively volumes of business that you send to them by proportion. Not actual numbers, which was the original proposal, but actual proportions. Now, most asset managers will say, I don't want Morgan Stanley to know that, in fact, I send most of my orders to Deutsche Bank or Barclays, because I've been telling Morgan Stanley for the last 10 years that I treat them the best and they are the most wonderful. <laughs> right? So that, that, that's going to be a real problem, and I think and don't forget, this is not information you disclose to your client, let's say a fund or a managed account, is actually meant to be published on your website in what they call a machine-readable format, i.e. someone can go to all the asset managers' websites and download all this information, put them in a spreadsheet, machine-readable after all, and compare everything. So if you're a broker, if you're a, if you're a Barclays, Morgan Stanley, and so on, it's, you know, it's, it's absolute gold because you will now know from every single client out there who you actually want to give the love to, right? So I think that's a real problem. And, and unfortunately, having seen what's in the leaked text, and by the way, disagree if you, if, if you feel so, I think the leaked text is probably going to end up being the final text. It is there. Okay, we, so we represent, I represent the Managed Funds Association, a big trade association for hedge funds, and we've been pushing for this for a long time. Unfortunately, they basically disagree. Now, to be clear, this is in a directive. So, so this proposal is in a, is in a, di direct, uh, in a directive, I believe. So there's still some potential for movement. But if it comes in a regulation, then of course there's no movement at all. So I think that's the real, the two main issues and best execution that everyone's going to have to pay attention to. You can imagine that investors themselves won't spend any time looking at the disclosures to consider whether their manager's actually achieving uh, best execution for the fund. It, will, it really is for a gift to the brokers. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Thank you. Thank it's you very much. Very disappointing. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, 
Uh, let's move on to the next topic, um, very broad topic of transaction record keeping. Um, I think it's fair to say in respect of record keeping itself, not much, uh, the direct is fairly benign and not much has really changed, but other than in two, two key areas, um, that of transaction record keeping and telephone taping. Um, again, Leonard, can I ask you to <coughs> give us a very quick um, overview of yeah, what, what's try, changing here? Sure, I'll try and do this in one minute. So record keeping is a, is, seems to be a bit of a problem <laughs> because you've got to record not just the time of execution with your broker, but also the time of decision making. So there's two records, right? And in and of itself, making a record of those two things, you probably think, well, what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is that there are about 40 items for you to uh, consider before making the record. And you need, you need to make the record immediately, so the legal text says. Again, this, this is a leak text. You must immediately make a record of all these uh, factors. There are about 40 factors. How do you make them immediately? Uh, there's a real question. So for example, portfolio manager says to trader, um, made a decision to execute trader then calls broker. Those are two separate things that have to be recorded immediately. I think that's a real operational challenge. We'll see whether or not, again, the FCA gives any guidance on this for UK firms. On the telephone taping aspect, I think most people here probably uh, rely on the current investment manager exemption, i.e. that uh, investment managers generally don't have to report, uh, sorry, don't have to record their, their telephone lines. But the FCA is proposing to take away that exemption. So the likely result so far uh, is that everyone's going to have to tape. And taping, of course, means cost. Uh, it means um, storage, because right now you store for six months if you tape, right, FCA rules. The new rules require you to keep it for up to seven years. Not only that, you have to, of course, the purpose of telephone taping is, again, like transaction reporting for market abuse monitoring. So they expect you to monitor the calls. And someone is going to have to do that. Now, of course, you could do it manually. You could have someone do random searches and random sit there and listen. And hopefully everything's in English, not Greek and Spanish and so on. Um, or some, you know, some clever service providers have already come out now and said, well, we'll do this. We'll sell you a system that will pick up particular keywords so that we'll red flag for you those things that you actually need to listen to. Whatever it is, all I can say is that if it does go forward, you just have to acknowledge that there will be increased costs, increased inconvenience. Some of our clients with two tape, everyone has three phones, private, internal, internal for the firm, and external to the broker. So that's something to think about as well. So <clears throat> given the amount of information you mentioned that has to be captured more or less immediately, um, perhaps we will see, we'll have to see a move to a more, an automated way of capturing this and, and an end to the, to the manual, manual blotter, I, I presume. Yeah, I think that's what they're really trying to uh, push for. Everything, as you know, moving to trading on exchanges, moving to automated systems, things like you know, voice broking and others are going to find it a, a real challenge, I think. Thank you very much indeed. OK, let's, let's move on. Um, uh, we let's move on to the topic. Of, we had a couple of things to, to, to raise, but I'm conscious of time. So let's uh, move on to the issue of uh, gold plating in general. We've, we've touched upon this a couple of times already. Uh, and we've spoken about asset, asset managers being a, some kind of homogenous mass, but of course, uh, the directive, and this also talks to one of the questions that's been posed, um, <clears throat> the directive uh, is not directly applicable, applicable to the entire asset management community. Um, AFIMs and USITs have their own directives to contend with. Um, but of course, MIFID does allow for the uh, um, for, for member states to impose additional requirements that go above and beyond uh, the MIFID's baseline requirements, if I can call them those. Um, Adam, you already mentioned the first CP heralded a little bit of a surprise around transaction reporting. Um, do we have a view on whether or not it's, it's possible to tell what the FCA's approach might be on goal placing some other provisions, possibly to add to the world of... Um, um, the, I suppose the, the crucial one will be on dealing commissions, and I, it, the, the question will be to what extent are the delegated acts compatible with what the FCA's already done in terms of its supervisory stance. There is then at European level a question of whether Europe will go the whole hog and actually formally... Uh, extend the dealing commissions provisions to USITs and AFIMs, which it signalled, what well, ESMA suggested in its advice to the Commission that it can, should consider doing. Mm. Um, but that is a bit further down, down the road at this stage, so it will largely be a question of what the FCA will do. Um, the, the transaction reporting one is an interesting illustration of perhaps that they are not wedded to the idea of all asset managers should necessarily have a very similar rule base, and uh, it's encouraging, I would say. And can we take anything from the recent events, uh, <coughs> some very topical recent events at the FCA? We had um, the departure of Martin Wheatley, of course, mm -hmm. and then 
last week's very illuminating discussion at the Treasury Select Committee with um, John Griffiths Jones, I think it was, and Tracy McDermott appearing before the committee. And <clears throat> that there followed thereafter a letter from that from Andrew Tyree, the chair of the committee, to the, to the Treasury contending that um, there's a perception that exists um, that perhaps the FCA is vulnerable to political pressure and that's uh, not very helpful to them. Do, we, do you think there's any way, any, any extrapolation we can make around um, the FCA's view of, 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 of regulation? Are we heading to a more, perhaps a more, more laissez-faire? It is tempting to say that we're witnessing a shift in regulation. It's, it's whether th those circumstantial things that you can add together really do make a compelling mm. case. So Martin Wheatley, he really was the, the cheerleader for unbundling. Um, he, he took a hard line approach of shoot first, ask the questions later, his departure dropping the banking uh, sector cultural review just before Christmas, some of the MIFID issues. Um, does that suggest that we'll see a new approach to regulation with Andrew Bailey? Potentially, potentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. except, that, except that unbundling has been discussed for 15 years now since <laughs> the Miners report in 2001, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you. Um, um, so just perhaps touching on a topic we've, I think we may have alluded to already, we have a polling question that's been begging to be answered for a while now on the screen. Um, if I can ask you again to, to get your thumbs at the ready, uh, when MIFID II causes your firm to adopt new policies, for example, with respect to dealing commissions, uh, will you roll these out? Will, will you roll out these new standards more broadly, or operate with different standards in different geographies? So, you do, if you do operate across different jurisdictions, what will the new rules mean? So, will you a globalise your standards or operate different standards? Uh, globalised standards seems to be the overwhelming winner there. That seems to make an awful lot of sense, I suppose. Um, although people, I suppose, are loath to superimpose voluntarily requirements upon themselves that aren't necessarily, uh, that, can, that can be compartmentalised to different jurisdictions. Okay, so uh, let's move on uh, as we move towards the end of the session. Uh, we should address, I suppose, the elephant in the room. That is um, the question of uh, question whether or not the directive will be delayed. Uh, and on that very question, um, Stephen Mayor was speaking at the beginning of January, I think, in Hong Kong, uh, where he recently said, where he, where he said, uh, it's very important for market participants and all of us to know on the question of the delay. Uh, I, would expect, I would expect that this will be settled in a few weeks, um, but whether it's a year or shorter or longer, or whether it's for all MIFID or only part of MIFID, that's really a political decision. And then he goes on, <clears throat> we, as Mr. suggested, a, a year delay, but that assumes a relatively speedy endorsement of the technical standards. The final making of these IT systems can only really start once the technical standards are finally set, and if that process is lengthened too much, then a year might not be sufficient. Um, can, we, can we accept that a delay is more or less inevitable? Anybody have a view on this? Perhaps from the industry bodies, chaps, do we think a delay is more or less inevitable? I'd bet money on it. Yeah, that's, that's good enough for me. Um, <laughs> okay, and then do we think it's um, a delay for the entirety of the directive or, or, or part or partial delay? What do we think? I think probably the entire. It would have to be for all of the, it had to be for all of it. Um, if it is too interconnected for only parts of it to be delayed and the other parts to come in on time. You don't know how much of a delay <coughs> the um, member states themselves will get when it comes to transposition because you could delay uh, the application date, but not actually delay transposition deadline at all, which is July currently. Um, they, they may well get uh, 12 months extra themselves. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, unfortunately, I think we may have run out of time, so we've got a, just a couple more polling questions to harass you with, if, if we may. Um, uh, and this is on the status of your own implementation <laughs> project, and um, just, just in terms of where you are, you, you the, the asset management community. Um, what is the status of your MIFID II implementation project? Are you on schedule, behind schedule, or paused awaiting the outcome of the delay proposals? Um, do we do we think that's a, a sensible approach um, in terms of planning? What do we have a view? Anybody care to share, offer an opinion on the 
I suppose it speaks for itself, I suppose, largely. It's a, it's, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I suppose a lot, the degree of the technical standards, I suppose, in the IT systems, for example, need necessarily to wait for the final rules, I suppose. But, um, but there's, isn't, isn't it Parkinson's law that dictates that <clears throat> the length of time it takes to, to perform an act, act, activity is really determined by the length of time you're given to do it. So one perhaps should necessarily take the entirety of the one year or two years to, to, do, to do these things. One thing that we would say that we see in, you know, out in the marketplace is that the the pause that's there is a, it's it's about knowing the final rules rather than about knowing the implementation date. You know, I fully expect that as soon as the final rules are set, we're going to see a rush of people starting to implement. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, just one last question. It's a bit of a cheeky one, I think. If I can uh, get it up on the screen. <clears throat> um, oh. Right, let me just skip that question. Let's go to the last, very last question. Can I do that? Oh, yeah, so last cheeky question, I suppose. Uh, MIFID 2, do we think it's a judicious update of the regulatory framework, or perhaps it's gratuitous uh, bureaucracy? What do we think, judicious update or gratuitous? Actually, I don't know if Okay, well, that definitely speaks for itself. Um, okay, I think that brings an end uh, to this first session. May I thank everybody on the panel for your contributions, for graciously accepting, uh, very grateful for your comments, and indeed you, the audience, for your participation. Um, I think it's been an, it's an illuminating session, if I can, as the chair, can say that. Uh, and we've learned that whilst the delay looks highly likely, uh, there's an awful lot of work to be done, whether or not there is a delay or no. That's a very good point Michael makes about um, understanding the scope of the rules. Um, so there's lots to do in terms of your own practical implementation and also in terms of strategic decision making in the way that you face the markets and I think that's where we turn to next um, at the next session. Thank you very much indeed. So if the next panel could uh, come up to the table. Just want to say that there is a there is a natural um, progression onto the next next uh, session right now. So there's no no break. Okay, so at the mention of uh, gratuitous bureaucracy, half the uh, people left the room, so that's, uh, that's encouraging. Um, what we want to do, and MIFID is a huge uh, directive, as we mentioned, it really does spread the um, uh, diversity of, of financial services. And on one side, I look at it, and I'm reading rules around product governance and distribution, and the other spectrum, I'm reading rules around tick sizes and, uh, and, and commodities. So what we want to do in this section is just have thoughts around some of the capital market impacts, um, particularly around the changes. You've heard some of these ma ma phrases mentioned already, phrases like OTF, and uh, we didn't get into the joys of systematic internalizers uh, earlier, we will do here. Um, and, and how these are gonna impact investment managers, that's the point of this. Um, and also around some of the liquidity aspects that was touched on in the disclosure, but particularly around fixed income. Um, and then also some of the technological challenges. So, and also, sorry, I've missed out quants and high frequency and the impact on those types of managers as well. So I'd like to, I'm going to join the panel down there, but I'd like them just to, perhaps if Neil could start, just to introduce themselves, and then we'll get into the first separate question. Hi, I'm Neil Robson. I'm Regulatory Compliance Partner at uh, Cadden Moochin. Um, been there 18 months, but before that, I spent almost five years at Schulte, Roth & Zabel here in London. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Joe Firrick. I'm Managing Director of a company called Millennium Europe Limited. We're a, a dealer, a market-making dealer in fixed income securities, particularly corporate bonds. Um, prior to that, I set up one of the electronic uh, trading platforms that people are talking about in Europe. Um, and prior to that, I worked for ABN uh, Managing Rates Business. 
Good afternoon, I'm Mark Croxon. Uh, I'm part of the Regulatory and Market Structure Strategy Group here at Bloomberg. Um, recently joined five months ago uh, and have worked for 20 something years in the banking industry, most latterly looking at this regulatory space. Well, thanks, I think also in five years of presenting this is the first time we've actually had somebody from Bloomberg on the panel, so welcome. Um, so if we could just go to the first question uh, to deal with, which should come up on the screen any moment time. This is really to deal with these execution opportunities that we were talking about. So one of the objectives of MIFID is to increase competition across financial markets. And do you expect this will move, this, and the case of move to on-market trading, will this provide investment managers with better execution opportunities, worse execution opportunities, or just more well-intentioned regulation? You could just vote now, please. Right, we'll have to answer cynics in the room, so uh, perhaps we set the tone earlier with that, um, but not convinced that this is actually going to improve execution. So, Neil, there's a number of different happenings in terms of the markets. Just could you explain to us what the different uh, options are going to be for firms around how they can provide execution to the investment management industry? Sure. I mean, just sort of setting the scene, as the, the last panel alluded to, in fact, MIFID 2 is an update to the structures we already have in place, the trading venues that you know, we've been used to for the best part of a decade now, basically. Um, actually, the, the directive itself in one of the recitals says that they want, or well, Brussels wants, as far as possible, to ensure that trading in financial instruments is carried out on organized venues and that such venues are appropriately regulated. So, you know, we've got regulated markets, which I'll move on to in a second. We've got multilateral trading facilities. Um, I think it was Leonard in the last panel was talking briefly about organized trading facilities as a new trading venue. And then there's the sort of poor orphan of MIFID 1 that really didn't quite have a home and didn't really work, which was the systematic internalizer. So these are the four sort of trading venues that are open to us in which MIFID 2 really tries to tie down more thoroughly so that it works better. Um, part of the rationale for this is the fact that the world has changed since MIFID I was first drafted. You know, it, it came into effect in 2007, but was drafted and tied down in 2004, the actual directive itself. The world has moved on, technology has moved on in a big way. Um, so that's why we're seeing these particular changes. So to step back to the two kind of key areas of MIFID I that have worked, the, the regulated market, which obviously has been in place for some time, these are your stock exchanges effectively, um, multilateral system operated or managed by a market operator which brings together or facilitates the bringing together of multiple third party buying and selling interests in financial instruments in the system in accordance with non-discretionary rules in a way that results in a contract with respect to the specific instrument admitted to trading on that market. So this is your core sort of equities trading venue. That's not really changing. They're quite happy, Brussels is quite happy that that works frankly. There's some tweaks, obviously, as, as was discussed on the last panel in terms of how, do, how trading takes place, the transparency itself, but the actual market itself is not really going to be changing. Same really goes to broad extent with the multilateral trading facility, which, again, is a multilateral system operated by an investment firm, significantly this time, or a market operator, which brings together multiple third-party buying and selling interests in that system, again, in accordance with non-discretionary rules, yet again. This time round, though, of course, the instruments don't have to be admitted to trading on that market. They're not listed instruments per se, but it's a more rigid trading venue subject to strict rules of the way it operates. Um, prime example of that, of course, is bats Chayex, which has grown and developed markedly over the, the period of MIFID I being in existence. So moving on, though, in terms of the new trading venues, um, the OTF, the Organized Trading Facility. Again, it's been phrased and sort of structured in a similar way in concept to the, the two venues I've just been talking about. Again, it's a multilateral system, but this time it's not either a regulated market or a multilateral trading facility. Again, it's somewhere where multiple third-party buying and selling interests can interact. Um, but this time around, significantly, it's focused on bonds, structured finance products, emissions allowances, and the derivatives thereof. But 
They interact in that system, but significantly, this time round though, the big distinction here is it is a discretionary type of market, a trading venue. So the operator of the market will be an investment firm, and it can basically pick and choose who it wishes to trade with, which is obviously very different than someone like the London Stock Exchange. The idea really here is it's supposed to sort of plug the gap because the multilateral trading facility, I think when MIFID I came in, people thought it would be more broad in concept and would capture more trading. Obviously it didn't, and the idea of the OTF is to pick up you know, the fixed income markets effectively so that it's more rigid, rigidity to the structure of how these <laughs> trades take place. Um, OTF operators can participate in match principle trading in the bonds, et cetera, that we've just referenced. So there's more flexibility to the market than obviously to someone like the London Stock Exchange. But again, you've got the whole issue of the transaction reporting, all the, all the topics that were covered on the last panel. So it's a, another more traditional sort of rigid market structure, which is being pinned down by MIFID II. Um, but because of that discretionary element, one thing that's rather different is certainly unlike a multilateral trading facility operator, is that because there's discretion, a lot of the rules on things like best execution, suitability, um, client order handling.